Welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jimmy, what are we talking about today? Wildcats artist Travis Charay spent about five or six years there at Wildstorm, created an amazing body of work. We're going to look at all of it. Cartoonist Kayfabe is partially brought to you by the Patreon. There are three different levels that will get you access to our videos first. And at the King Kayfaber level, you will get access to all of our videos before anyone else. It will give you a leg up on the Kayfabe effect, which means as our station gets more popular, these books disappear quickly off the aftermarket. You want to be the first one in line if we show something that you want to add to your collection. So check out our Patreon, see which level suits you best. We are also a daily YouTube channel. We have about 1,500 videos covering various cartoonists and comic books. If you go to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube homepage, you can search through our archives for your favorite creator or comic book. Today we are looking at Travis Charay, an artist that I learned about whenever he starts working for Jim Lee and Wildstorm Studios, primarily doing Wildcats there at Wildstorm. He had done a little bit of DC work before this, but to me this is where he really be comes into his own. And we're going to look at it from uh, early on. Till he basically leaves Wildstorm around 2000. And uh, this is our first example here. And you can see even from the design that this is very early <laughs> in, the, uh, in the image days. This is 1993 copyright. So I think this is the first Travis Charay work at Wildstorm. There's a, a group of different anchors putting this together. This is a special, kind of like an annual. And uh, often you would see with these early image books, the specials were all hands on deck. Yeah, You know, you would get like a, sometimes a selection of artists working together. In this case, Sheree is doing all of the penciling, but different inkers on top of him. And Scott Williams here on page one. The other thing that you'll watch progress, because we're going to cover about seven years a across the books that we're showing, the coloring. You know, this is very, very early digital coloring in 1993, and it's overpowering. It's, it's kind of dark on the page there. That's going to change quite a bit over these uh, over the books that we show today. So keep that in mind as we go through here. If you're interested in the production side of comics, it's kind of neat to watch that evolve. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to think about because uh, at this era, 93, uh, Jim Lee's getting uh, J. Scott Campbell on the hook. So he's kind of a polar opposite of... Uh, of Travis, but at this stage, like Gen 13 first miniseries and like this era artwork, uh, there's, there is similarities, you know, a lot of spotting of blacks. I was also thinking about coming, coming, like going through this this week. I was looking at stuff like, like this to me, that's a very Jim Lee esque piece. Absolutely. And, and the art style is like, you can see the glimmers of Travis's work. Yes. And, uh, you know, I just realized, like, like I, sh I should have pulled. I have, I have Dark Stars, mm -hmm. which is uh, his Travis's uh, DC work, and you could see probably what excited uh, Jim Lee to to get him on the hook, and it really was kind of pushing the Jim Lee style. But he does start to evolve over time. You can start at just like grabbing some of those comics. I'm going to, but I, I do want to point out, like, there, there's something that his artists develop. Like, there's a a similarity, a medium sh shot that, that seems to be repeated, you know, because I think he gets really good with compositions, but it's not here. You know, here it's it's sort of boring where, like, everybody's about the same size and uh, wanted to give a good look at this first one because he is going to evolve quite a bit in right. a relatively short amount of time, I think. This is his first regular issue, I believe, and uh, this is 94, so, you know, Part of the studio, I assume he was working out of a studio. That's what, like, Extreme and Wild Storm both had that early on. Troy Hubs is going to be the main anchor for most of what I show from Wildcats Volume 1 here. And he'll change some different writers as he goes along. But to me, this is a big difference already from what we saw in that special. And some of that is probably Troy Hubs as an anchor. And some of it is probably Travis Charest becoming more comfortable. You know, right. even trying some interesting stuff here with 16 panel page and you, splash pages. And you're starting to see the faces that you associate yes. with, with his work. He has a very distinct nose that's going to emerge. You know, you see it like in profile, this face, I think you can see a lot of his work there. Yeah. Thoughtful about applying his shadows, marks that define that. But you're still seeing that early digital coloring just right. super powered. Yeah, dude. This is This is the era of like... Inkers and colorists, let's fight. Totally, totally. Because uh, when you're putting black on your on your images, you're suggesting light, and uh, the the colorist might not always uh, be be on board with your thoughts and ideas. Look at this terrible lettering. 
It's very true, you know, the the um, suggesting the lighting part, but sometimes the artist doesn't write either. So, like, yeah. you're drawing cheekbones or shoulder muscles or something like that, and it's contradictory to the triceps. Right. And so, you know, if you're doing model color like this, I don't think it's easy for the, the colorist. You know, I don't know that they come in and they're sabotaging, but that's the way it works. How about that for, that's also Travis Charest, but with a different inker to kind of demonstrate really how different this stuff can look. Yeah, it has a tightness that is, like, not very sexy where his work is concerned now dude let's look at this very next one like i pulled this off of a, a newsstand like like wildcats was i got this at freaking giant eagle when when uh when this was fresh out it was on it was on uh uh newsprint and you can imagine what that color must look like yeah that's bizarre sounding and I feel like even from this is only one issue later, I feel like it's taken a big step. Yeah. So it might be uh, a penciler and an inker communicating like what, what they're looking for. There could be a period of time between these two issues, too. That's possible. You yeah. Know, it, could, it could be as much as three months. Yeah. Kyoto is your colorist through most of this run, too. And I think that the coloring gets better and better as it goes. So it's not even necessarily a problem with, oh, we just need to hire colorists and people that have no idea what they're doing. I think the technology was just... You had to see it in print and learn from it. Yeah, yeah. Chiota was uh, a th probably like one of the most thoughtful colorists of, of the Wildstorm crew. Also, he was like the one colorist of all those dudes, Ruben Rude, Steve Olive, who would use pinks. Like, I pink, that, pink yeah. was never, or in purples, like that's a part of the, the Chiota color. Yeah, definitely. And at this point, like, I think Sheree has distinguished himself from the typical, you know, Jim Lee kind of clone. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's so weird how those guys would show up and they all sort of looked like Jim Lee at first and then they would become what they were. Totally. He still, there's glimmers. You yep. still have the bullshit fake hatching and stuff. Yeah, I think it's probably inevitable too. I imagine. But like this. Jim Lee walking through, you know, and weighing in on pages or, <laughs> right? You know, if you if you want these guys to look, if you want your books to look a certain way. I, I, I would, I would think that. But this, this, right. This does not look like yeah. a page out of the Jim Lee I, I would think that when you see stuff like that, it's more the artist, like, it's chilling effect. It's like, I always thought, like, because, like, you know, I was super into, like, how to draw comics the Marvel way and all that stuff. And I'm like, that is the opposite punch. Like, that is the wrong, that you know, that's like the mid-range. Like, you either have the clock when you're about to sock somebody or, like, the follow-through. And that's uh, yeah, extremely tough. undynamic. <laughs> that is That is definitely tough. How about that for your... How similar does the toy ad look to the actual drawing of uh, one of those characters? <laughs> That's the era, man. All right, I'm going to show off some covers here, but we're going to skip ahead a few pages. But this one, again, feels like, okay, we, we, we've, we're distinguishing ourselves. Right. You know, you're starting to look like your own stuff. Barry Windsor Smith cover. Can't pass up showing off some Barry Windsor Smith on here. So bizarre that he was, like, involved in this crossover. He was just making money hand over fist, dude. All right, so... This is one that I recently reread. I think we looked at this on an episode. This is Alan Moore is taking over Wildcats, and it's something of a relaunch. And it's very fun to see Alan Moore sum up these characters yeah. that have only been around for you know two years and not much of story. Up so to that point. yeah, so funny too because they got to build in your Hellfire Club. Like just take all the X Men tropes that you can. Yeah, absolutely. This video is brought to you by the books that we make. Coming out in November, I have Street Angel, Princess of Poverty from Image Comics. This collects all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Street Angel, Deadly Scroll Alive, also available from Image Comics. I've also been self-publishing. True Crime Funnies you can buy on my website, jimrug.com. You can also get these from patreon.com slash jimrug, where you can find 1986 and BW zines. As Hulk Grand Design is my contribution to the Grand Design series from Marvel Comics. These are... Going out of print, so pick this up if your comic shop still has one and you haven't added it to your shelf yet. Ed's latest, Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus. 500 plus pages of all the Hip Hop Family Tree comics, plus 140 bonus pages. X-Men Grand Design collects Ed's three X-Men Grand Design volumes in one easy-to-find trade paperback because several of those original volumes are out of print. And Red Room, Anti-Social Network and Trigger Warnings, both available now with a third volume, Crypto Killers, coming in January. And now back to our video. And again, I think Sheree is, is here now. Um, he's going to continue to evolve, but definitely sort of his own flavor. I think it's a good pairing, him and Alan Moore. Like, how I mean, excited are you if you're a young artist and he, Alan Moore shows up? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's much more inspired scripts than you're getting from uh, Brandon Choi, but I guess James Robinson is some of those as well. 
Yeah. And, you know, you can see the variation in shots. Like that first issue that I flipped through, I was like, look at how it's all medium shots. You know, you can see that he's really playing with scale now. He also starts to figure out white space, which right. is one of the things I think he really does well as, uh, as this work progresses. You'll see more and more of that open panels, you know, like in order to get that white space out. Nice stuff, though, all around. Even trimming that panel in, like, film to be, uh, you know, I guess a security footage or something. Once once we get to, like, Wildcats X-Men era, that's, like, one of the heights of uh, his his career to me because he's still playful here, and he's still allowing, a, like, a lot of his, himself to kind of come, show up in the artwork. Yeah. He gets to a point of precision. Like, his issue of that Ambassadors, where the backgrounds look like they could have been Google SketchUp and just... Uh, Super, super tight. This one I have to show off. Not for Travis Charest, but because Kevin Nolan... I think he's working over Dave Johnson, too. Yeah. But it's... When Kevin Nolan's doing finishes, it's Kevin Nolan. Totally. <laughs> and I think uh, anytime you find Kevin Nolan, it's exciting for me. It's funny because I actually see... Th there will be panels here where I'm like, ooh, that almost looks like Travis Charest. He has a fine line. Yeah. And from, from what I remember, like, of this era, Travis, he was turning in work... It's taken him a long time to make his pages. So the creative solution that they've discovered that that they put together was like we'll have like an A team, B team. Like yes. the the original Wildcats will be drawn by you know this guy or that guy, Dave Johnson, whatever. And then Travis, like how many pages do you think you get in this month? But if you notice, he becomes the B the B lister. Like you you put you put those pieces like in the back. Yeah, there's um it's very sporadic too. Like there'll be complete issues that are missing from him. These are his pages here, uh, but it, it's it's very much hit or miss. Like, there are issues that don't have anything. And, you know, this is all colored, but it's basically the white space, right? There's no right. panel borders. There's no background. So if you saw this as a page, what you're getting are just these figures. And then it's when kind you of amazing. And then when you see all this uh, verbiage, then you realize, like, oh, man, maybe I shouldn't put much white space because, uh, you know, this is just giving the writer, like, so much license to just put so much, so many words now, I guess if it's Alan Moore's the guy putting the words, that's okay. But you yeah. don't want those uh, stable guys to do it. And you can see he's doing these line pieces that are going to come up in the X-Men Wildcats. You yeah. It's another piece that uh, he has deviated from the Jim Lee Scott Williams style for hatching. And instead he's running like these little parallel dashed like lines. It feels uh, really very European. There. Very Mobius. Definitely moves in that direction. So, you know, you wonder when he starts looking at that stuff. Probably sometime before this book. Yeah, doesn't he like go to France or, or so? like? He, I thought like, disappears so. From America for a while. Yeah, I don't know if he's even from France. For all I know, you know, maybe he came here and worked for a bit and then went back. I, I really don't know the answer to that. Don't know that much about the uh, the guy. He's trying some things, right? Like we didn't see him playing around with hair in that in that way. Yeah, definitely thoughtful about the design and composition. And I think that's an outgrowth that you see in his use of white space, which is not on display here. Although maybe if you consider that background as white space you know like in the black and white composition of these pages you would be seeing a lot of white used right probably is a balance to how much black he is now spotting which again not something i think about when i think wild storm so a few more issues that he contributes to this one he is inking the cover himself um i don't know how much distinctions there that's a little bit dark to me from the coloring side of things but you do see that he's starting to ink himself. Yeah. So that's a piece, right, of an artist developing the way he wants things to look. Canadian fella. Okay. Thanks to Chuck Arnold in the in the chat. See, this is very much uh, what I think of when I think of uh, Travis's work. All right. So he's almost done on this volume one of Wildcats. Um, Jim, I think that's a Jim oh, Lee yeah. cover. Oh, yeah. yeah. Jim Lee and Bennett there on the cover. It's fun to see him dipping in and out, too, at this stage. And this will be his last Wildcats from Volume 1. And I think he's inking himself, or at least some of these, he's inking himself on some of these pages. And it's very short. It's like uh, six pages, I think, that he does in this issue. Look at how much the colorist is adding. You know, those are not Shere cloud drawings. Right. I wonder, like, who's given that direction? Is that up to the colorist to be like, you know what, I think I'll put a background here where the artist didn't draw one? Or is that, like, editor or Jim Lee looking at it and saying, like, we need to have a little that more was, on this page. Yeah, it's a little bare. You wonder, man. You and you and you hope that a guy like Jim Lee would have some eye and and be like, you know, if you don't put a hundred percent effort on these pages, and uh, I can't pay you a hundred percent of your page rate. 
So this is this is something that I realized whenever I was putting these together. I thought this followed next, and this was like the last piece that he did, and it's not. No. This, this volume comes after the Wildcats X-Men crossover. This is Golden Age. This, How about this for Faith in Your Artist? This was the first Wildcats X-Men release, Golden Age. Right. And Jim Lee gives it to Travis Charest as the guy that he picks to do it. Well, like, follow our wizard coverage, because Jim Lee is very busy doing Fantastic Four comics, and uh, that, that's when all this stuff is happening. When these, I think, I think it's part of the deal that that uh, Rob and, and uh, Jim Lee made with Marvel to like do these crossovers, and the remarkable stuff to me, like I swear to God, uh, I saw I saw um, originals. From I looked this, up originals for this, and it has like Copic, Copic markers, like on the originals. That's what I thought too, and uh, like even Heritage says it's ink wash. So I, mean, I, I wonder about but, that. But, but but it's all good. There's there's a gray medium. This there is, is a gray th medium. Th this is not black and white line reproduction. And I and to me this is like this is the the height of his his work because it still is Travis Charest work. It still has some whimsy to it and some of his own personal style. He's adding those grays, which is reining in the fucking colorists. Which I think is like a very, very strong uh, I idea. It fits really well in a story like this that's set in the past. You yeah. know, it's a period piece, so let's desaturate it. You know, give it that look of like, it's not exactly sepia tone, although on some pages that's it. But it's that limited color that almost looks like black and white, but spruced up. You know, so it's old, but it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't look cheap or, or something. You know, like they felt that a little bit of color would add to it. But it is interesting when you look at some of this stuff. This is... Charest is doing these gradations, yeah, you know, and, these and marks his, on the originals. Yeah, exactly, and his ink washes and stuff. Yeah, really interesting look. And he doesn't stick with this very long. It's just for this this uh, this comic. He does a couple of... Um, we'll see it in that second volume of Wildcats. He'll do this thing that I, I compare it to Sam Keith. Not in the in the final look, but in the sense that, like, you can see he is playing with a couple of these things where it's almost painted. Right. Of, like, bringing in, I guess, ink washes or markers. I thought it was markers, too. Like, it feels like markers to me. Some of the the edges and things, you know? You can almost see, like, a, a definite bleed. edge, yeah. But even those are hard for me to determine because people blend markers and stuff. So it gets very difficult for me to tell exactly it, what the media is. Yeah, and I see that looks like ink wash. Though. Like, and I, I have all those Copics, right? The French grays and the cool grays and stuff. Like you could, there's a 50 grays you could play with to get the perfect bleeds and the, the perfect blends. Yeah. This was a, this was a, a book that I knew a lot of people loved. Yeah. Um, yeah I had I friends who were like, this is the guy, this is him. And you can see why, like nothing else looked like this at the time, which is always a good thing to me. And I even think he would do like some of this lettering is his, I believe. That makes sense, man. Because uh, like the line feels like it. Yes. But, uh, you know, when I went to art school in 2000, uh, there was the, the Travis Charest school of of uh, mark making with uh, cer certain kids. And, uh, of course, this is this was a, a tentpole book. Some of those guys even uh, carry carried on over the years and, and would... Uh, kind of handle their original art that same way i always loved when he would do lines because he would do this in like sweaters and jackets you know like if he had a chance to put lines and stuff i loved it it was a way that he would do form mm -hmm. and and it would work like that's probably about as good as it gets you know having the folds and wrinkles in a sweater yeah he was very good at a lot of this stuff and it just didn't look like wild storm you know like no. it was really something that he was bringing to the table like he evolved into himself quickly and again you see that attention to spotting blacks and whites you know, it's a, it seems to be a very conscious, like, awareness of the overall page composition. Yeah, just creating that balance. This was always weird to me that this was the launch of the Wildcats X-Men stuff because it's just like Wolverine. You know, like, it, it doesn't feel like an X-Men crossover, but it was cool to see Charade doing Wolverine. And if you were just going to do one, one X-Men, that's certainly the one I would prefer that you do, <laughs> at least at that time. Wildstorm Effects gets credit as a colorist. Not much color in there. Right. It's, uh, I don't know, stealing a little bit of glory. So they relaunch Wildcats. Volume 2, I think this is about 1998 or 99, copyright 99. Was that busy on the cover? It was, yeah. I think they did a, a number of covers. This wasn't like the main cover. This is just the one that I found when I rebought these. But uh, I love Bisley, so no complaints. But that's not, you know, no, yeah, not yeah. the main cover. Bisley, by the way, around this time, does a Warblade, like, Five or six issue miniseries. Is it the one where Warblade's like an artist, a painter? 
I don't know if I've read it, but it's Warblade being Bisley esque. Okay, that's know. not the one then. Yeah, there, there, there's good stuff in it. Man, what a what a waste of talent that would be if it's just calm, calm Warblade. It, it might have been uh, Wiesenfeld. It, it, I think it was somebody good, and then it's like, what? Is he just painting? We've switched inkers now. Richard Friend is now on board for inks for, I think, this entire run. And it runs about five or six issues and trails off. You know, I, I assume that it's a scheduling thing. But look at how good the colors have evolved compared to, like, that 1993 early digital coloring. Like, now, guys are, have figured out how to use digital coloring much better at this point. <laughs> I also think his art probably lends itself to the digital coloring a little better, too. Yeah, we talked about a little bit with like Frank Whiteley, uh, where you know you got to start to pull off some of the blacks and things to just let let the color do do a little more of the labor. Pretty f impressive is like page layouts, you know, like this is just sound effects with shells going out of the panel, um, or ornamental backgrounds in some of these. Yeah, which is a long way from like that last Wildcats Volume One that had no backgrounds. Right. You see him really pouring into it, and you know it's an issue one. So I'm gonna guess that your deadline's a little bit, a little bit more. It establishes loose. the pace. It's a pace car. Those, uh, these, these kind of triangle feet. That that was that was a trope of uh, the early 2000s, yeah. uh, d doing doing that kind of uh, shoe and stuff. And and see, it's still whimsical. It's still wild. He wouldn't do that now. Right there it is the Cubert School Correspondence Courses, <laughs> baby. One of my favorite uh, pieces of his is a cover. I think it's from I think it's from this volume of Wildcats, but it's a couple issues later, and there's like a brontosaurus and this little cat in an astronaut suit, um, and it's totally it's probably the peak of the whimsical stuff. I love it. Maybe it wasn't well received that he moved away from it, but it was stuff I really liked. You know, it's, it's shapes, mm -hmm. so he can he can show you that he can do a rooted face that has like solid anatomy and feels three dimensional, but then he'll get he'll get um, abstract with some some of the stuff. See, I I I love this. There's no heel to the foot. It's completely wrong <laughs> but in in the gestalt right like it, it looks it looks great it, it, it's a little style flourish that i think is it's you know spelling uh bastards wrong and inglorious bastards or something like that and here i think is where you start to see what i think of as travis charay maybe throughout the 2000s. Yeah, going humanoids. It, yes, and I think this is markers, I'm guessing. Maybe it's a little bit of like that white medium, maybe paint, some kind of something to come in and do your highlights on wrinkles and, and everything. But this is what you see him doing, especially as he moves away from Wildcats or as he does more covers. It starts to really resemble this. It's attractive, but it's, it's so different than how he started. I always think that about these guys. Like whenever you go in and become a fan, it's almost like, that's where, you know, you sort of, that's your favorite of them. Yeah. And then they keep evolving and it's like, well, I like this period or this phase. But again, I think this is a, as a page layout, it's super attractive, you know, leave some room for things to breathe, concentrate on the things that you are drawing. Yeah. Far shots, you know, every range of shot. Yeah. Like pretty wild. You turn a page from, from a car and a very natural scene to this guy hooked up to all the wires. Love it, dude. You start to feel like the the French influence is coming in because because there's there's heavy metal vibes. Whenever it doesn't have to be a Wildstorm comic, like he's he's bringing in the European influences. Let's see how these triangle feet are constructed now that you remove the shoe. And there it is. They just don't <laughs> have heels, dude. It's 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 cool, you know. Like it it doesn't. You don't have to see. That's the thing. Like the stuff that he's like that ambassadors comic that he did. Like the backgrounds and stuff. It's so tied to the reference that it's not so fun to look at but like you you fuck up a hill or whatever it's kind of it's kind of cool yeah you wonder like something like this guys going underwater and comes up and it and it looks wet right like wet hair and everything is this made up like i, I can't imagine he's setting something up to get a photo of that so really can't, like this is this is my favorite era i guess is what i'm saying there yeah and again, I think you're very complimentary in the colors and how this is handled. But you see this face. This is where he's starting to play with, I think, a little bit of gray media in the original art. Right. And all of these issues would have like maybe a page or a scene or a sequence. And I flagged a couple of them to show that off because I think it's interesting that he's doing this. You know, that's what your black and white line art looks like. This is with some shadow and shading and stuff put onto the original. You end up with very limited color palette then. You know, there's a little bit less for the colorist to do. Yeah. You wonder if that's if that's something, if there was some tension between the two that it was like, 
this is how I want my figure shaded. I, you know, I think you do that, and I think it's probably a conversation because you have to see what it looks like in print. You know, you got to see if it turns out because you're, you're scanning it differently now. Right. This is awesome to me because I bitch about how much brown and gray coloring there is. This is almost before they entered that phase. You know, like, look how bright that is. The right. Blue and greens and skin tone looks like peach color. Really cool. How about that for a shocking image? The yeah. Ice Cream Man pulls a machine gun on a kid, man. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a famous uh, image. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to do that one today, but... Oh, I thought I had another thing flagged in one of these, but I guess not, not until we get to the end. So uh, I'm missing issue five, and I'm guessing maybe he didn't do issue five. Right. I could be wrong. It may just be that whenever I bought these for a dollar to restock, they didn't have issue five. So it's possible he did that. But as this goes on, you, you will see like uh, issue six, you're starting to see other people filling in uh, a lot of stuff. And I think that's his last interior issue. But see the shading on the hands, on the head, you know, like this would happen more and more frequently as this went along. And again, I just think of Sam Keith as the guy that would do that, where it would go from pen and ink to suddenly it's like, here's a painted page. Loved it in the Max, and, you know, why not here? Because line drawing, shading on a face, and line drawing all on the same page. Definitely a guy who's experimenting and trying to keep pushing. You know, you can almost get a sense that he's not at his uh, final formed stage here. He, he was definitely keeping it unorthodox, and... Uh we just illustrated that he would look a little different every time you've seen him. So that was part of the attraction to see like, what, what's he going to do next? And he always, he, he's a seeker, you know, like it, 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 you had that vibe, like as you were picking his stuff up, you know, you never knew exactly w where it was going to go. And there are bleeding edge parts. Like some of that in between stuff, it, it doesn't hit, it doesn't work so well, but he checks it out in print and then recalibrates. This is another one of those examples where I think he's doing a lot with markers. I mean, this is a Drew Struzan aesthetic, totally. you know, like with, with all of those tools, uh, color pencil, maybe like, like everything that Jules, Drew Struzan puts, puts to use. Like that's, that's what he was fucking around with right there. Yeah, definitely. I wondered with some of these, if he was inking them himself, cause the inks look different to me than uh -huh. the previous pages. And like I say, I think this is his exit issue. And if you read the credits, it's just like, five artists or something in that line. So you'll see it shift, you know, in ways that I don't know if you could identify. There's probably multiple hands on several of these pages is my guess, but it wouldn't surprise me if he inked a few of those, you know, like, okay, yeah, clearly yeah. we're done with, we're done with him here. <laughs> right. But it wouldn't surprise me if like one of his last moves was, you know what, let me ink this scene and then, and then I'm going to head over to France right? and I'm going to do some work over there. And so this is what I would always hear about because he was a popular artist with people in my circle. So when he disappears from regular comics, it's kind of like, oh man, he's working on this Meta Barons project with Jordorowski and it's going to be fantastic. That's his cover. So you can kind of see, you know, should have these as like the evolution, right? You can almost see him. He's, he's gone clear, drew screws in here. And now he's coming in and maybe add some lines, you know, keep pushing that style. I almost wonder if this is a bigger image that he crops to make it that cover image because it feels so solid. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you could see like texture in the paper, like maybe it's blown up, certainly compared to the interior. And this features um, several chapters. So we're just getting like a sample of the uh, Charest artwork in the last chapter, even a Mobius uh, chapter that's very poorly colored, in my opinion. Um, but you get to see him doing his full on like blending of colors which is wild. You know, this is where I was saying, like, I can't tell what the media is. I know you can blend markers and things. I don't know if that's what he's doing, but I mean, some of those gradations are, they look so smooth. It almost looks like it's a digital gradation. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like a collage up top there. Right. And I don't think it is. I think it's on the page mostly. Yeah. This is like the humanoids aesthetic, like you can see the, the heelless feet. That's just, that's just like how he draws, you know? Uh, this has the humanoids aesthetic and uh, it's so, it's one of those interesting styles because it's so accomplished. There's so much going on, but there's also so much of it and a bunch of dudes doing it that I don't look at it. Like, like it's, it's like, yeah, this is awesome. Cause cause it also fits into the heavy metal aesthetics yes. of, of like those like albums that would be done and all that stuff. And it's like, yeah, you guys are badasses you bore me as a, as a comic. It's, it's good mark making. It's good image making, but as a comic, it's shit. Most of what I'm looking for in the comics are, are things that like I do or aspire to do. And this just isn't it. 
It's very different. I admire the uh, the the level of craft that is on display here. Right. But it does feel like um, I was thinking like RPG games. Yeah. You know, like those got very polished. That kind of fantasy art. Yeah. At some level, and especially once you get into like helmets and the detail of like the armor and everything, really feels that way. And you can see he's putting in the effort. You know, it's not like it's just the polished surface, but that's an important component to where he's at at this stage. I mean, the choreography, you know, he's clearly like putting a lot onto these pages. I also wonder if these pages are maybe two up right. from what we're seeing here, because this is astonishing detail. I just I don't think you can draw that at one and a half up. Yeah, not not, not at all. It's amazing, though, what, he, what he's putting on. Yeah, it's I beautiful. wonder, like, it doesn't work as comics. Photo, uh, you know, what kind of reference he's right. using to build this kind of stuff this is that kind of that old conversation about like you know can can da vinci make a good comic and and you know there's no evidence suggesting that he would like yeah he's master of composition master of paint all this kind of stuff but can you tell a story and can you tell a story in an interesting way can you can you choose the right angles and honestly looking at this kind of stuff makes you appreciate a guy like frank quitely even more who has super tight chops who now is coloring his stuff you know since sandman endless nights and and um he did his ambassador's piece, choosing the right angles. Everything looks right, uh, but it's a breezy kind of fun read. And I'm only comparing them because it, both of those guys did ambassadors' issues, you know. And and like if for my taste, like one is far more attractive yeah. than the other. There's, but but he's even evolved further beyond this to like, you know, the style is different in in that ambassadors. I comment. need to check that out because I, I flipped through it quickly at a store once. I didn't buy it, and now I, I kind of regret not buying it because I'm just curious to look at it in yeah. greater depth. Um, there's one other piece that I don't have any print representation of, and it's like Rocket Girl, I think is the name of it, where he was doing essentially daily strips. So they're in that horizontal strip format. Um, it's reminiscent in some ways of the X-Men Wildcats because it's a limited palette. It's very sepia tone. Those are really attractive. Um, I think there may have been a limited print run, maybe something that he did himself, you know, like for shows. Uh, but that's stuff you can find online, and I think they're very attractive, and they kind of fill in maybe a little bit of gap. But it's a little bit more on the drawing side that appeals to me rather than the finished painted look. They're going to see what the King K Fabers are seeing in the top piece right here. <laughs> but here's our Travis work from Ambassadors, and let's see, let's see how how it looks on the uh, monitor. But you could see he's he's now in an era where he could snap a picture of a hand holding a phone, and and I and I would bet he probably did a little of that for some of this stuff. I wonder if he's coloring this himself. He's doing so much rendering and like the cross hatching and stuff on skin and clothes and everything. You know, it makes me it makes me kind of wonder. Like that ground is so perfect that I just know he's not measuring that out and doing that himself. You know, like he's he's starting from a place of high technology photographs and it, it, he seems way more bound to the reference than he was before he could decentique it up and stuff yeah that, that something like that like that la this area i feel like could be a google sketchup piece same, right. same with this some of this other stuff though like this background i think that's kayfabe mm -hmm. and and that works for me it's almost like a like a texture or something that you're putting in the background it could be wallpaper and and you see like th i think this comes from a photo and when you do that sort of thing it fucks up your foreshortening and things like these like little hands it, it's uh i don't know it's boring unfortunately for my tastes yeah i do like exaggeration and cartooning and the more accurate you get, you're right. Like it, it does become almost like I paused the movie. Yeah, and... another example. Like uh, you, you could cast these people, and, and that pose is very normal. Like like uh, he has a photo of somebody in his family or somebody who's who's in that position, and uh, you know he makes his collage and, and turns out the comic that way. So it's very bound by the reference, uh, unfortunately. But. Hey, at least Mark he's Miller making comics. It. Bring, bring, keep making them, Travis. <laughs> like, keep making them is, uh, yeah, I guess. is my plea. Good to go. Yes. Okay, Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are uh, available. Uh, the vids are brought to you by the books that we make. And uh, before you is a very robust section of uh, the books that we have available uh, to begin there's the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus, uh, collecting all of my Hip Hop Family Tree works. It's the 10 year anniversary of Hip Hop Family Tree, 50th anniversary of hip hop as a culture. Uh, the books are going quick. 
the books are going fast and uh, they're flying off the store shelves so get it quickly uh, if you want it uh, in any sort of timely fashion not the only holiday effort We've got the trade paperback for the x-men grand design trilogy from marvel comics is going to be available in stores on november 14th got the comp copies of that uh right now two trade paperbacks of red room are out there anti-social network and trigger warnings with a third coming to you called crypto killers in 2024 uh january jimmy what do you have street angel princess of poverty is my next release it'll be out at the end of november from Image Comics, you should be able to get that wherever books are bought and sold. It is a companion piece to Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, also from Image Comics. These two books, besides looking good on your shelf like a set next to each other, collect all of the Street Angel comics that I have made so far. So pick up both of those if you haven't already. I have been self-publishing True Crime Funnies. That's a collection of nonfiction stories. The 1986 zine celebrating the greatest year in comics history and the BW zine celebrating the black and white explosion and self-publishing boom of the 80s and early 90s. These are all available on patreon.com slash jimrug if you want to read them now. Otherwise, uh, follow me and I'll let you know whenever they're available to buy from my website, jimrug.com. And Hulk Grand Design, my contribution to the Grand Design series. Um, I believe these are out of print, so pick it up if you haven't already whenever you see it in a comic shop. Um, these are disappearing fast and hard to tell when they'll be back. The books are the most important part of keeping that Cartoonist Kayfabe channel going. Uh, we are a daily YouTube channel with more than 1,500 videos uh, available to you right now. Give the channel a search. Uh, go on the front page. Hit the magnifying glass. Search for your favorite comics. Check out those episodes. If we did not talk about your favorite uh, comics, let us know what they are in the comments, and we will uh, push those comics a little bit higher on our uh, to-read piles. Uh, the Patreon helps subsidize the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Uh, three different levels of participation there, but the King Kayfabers, the, you know, the top dogs, they get all the videos that we shoot before anybody else gets to see them. They're hanging out with us in the live stream uh, chat room right now as we are recording and we always shoot a couple extra videos at least one extra video so uh, there's a big queue of videos that develop that only the kings have access to before we release those you know later on down the line when jimmy and i have to take a break or something like this uh once again the books are the most important part but there are a few other ways to support the channel jimmy let the people know you can subscribe to the cartoonist kfab newsletter at the links below this video to keep up on what we have coming out and when you can also pick up cartoonist kfab t-shirts merchandise Hats, cups, mugs, stickers, and lots more of the Cartoonist Kayfabe Enterprise <laughs> at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. So uh, there it is. We laid it out. You have uh, num num numerous ways that you can uh, support the channel and keep these videos coming to you on a regular basis. Jimmy, without further ado, uh, let's get out of here. But first, please give everybody their marching orders. Read more comics. <laughs>